We are live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, bouncing back from the bottom, was this weekend's crash in crypto capitulation? We'll discuss the price moves with Kavita Gupta, founder of the Delta Blockchain Fund. And going mainstream, NFT NYC is one of the largest crypto conferences of the year. We'll have more on the NFT interest that's growing with Amy Wu of FTX. Plus, shorting Bitcoin, a new ETF launches today that bets against the cryptocurrency after it's already lost 70% of its value. All of that is ahead, but first let's get a snapshot of the market. As we hinted at, it has been a wild ride over the last week. Bitcoin on Saturday taking a trip below $18,000, the lowest level since November of 2020, but it has bounced back in quite spectacular fashion. Right now, we're north of $21,000, up about 4.7% on the day. You have Ether prices up a little more than 4% as well, trading right around 1166 And some of the altcoins like Solana and Polygon are outperforming. Dogecoin also is outperforming, up about 11.5%, just shy of seven cents. Elon Musk speaking at the Cutter Economic Forum, talking about how he supports it, how he did that because he was encouraged to do so uh, by certain people who aren't necessarily particularly wealthy. But of, of course, Doge Dogecoin often moves in tandem with whatever Elon Musk says, so we have to keep that in mind. Now that we've heard from Elon Musk, here's what other market participants also have had to say about the outlook for crypto ahead. We're seeing uh, large retraces back down to sort of all-time lows. I had hoped this year was 30,000, 50,000. Uh, Bitcoin. In my view, the value of most cryptocurrencies is zero, so we're still very far away from that. You're seeing this liquidation of risk, mm -hmm. and crypto's got caught up with it. Too much leverage? There's so much leverage. There's, there's a lot of greed. The overall valuations are down significantly. That's fantastic for the business we're in. Now is also the best time to do M&As. There's blood in the waters, and the sharks are swimming around. I have never said that people should invest in crypto. Maybe the, the top was indeed in November of 2021. It's going to take a little while for crypto to regain a narrative and regain confidence. All right. So since there's little on the fundamentals, let's look to the technical analysis on crypto. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abigail? Well, Matt, you were mentioning capitulation. That's something that we started to explore in the charts last week. So let's take a look at a chart of Ether that supports the idea of capitulation also. Capitulation essentially being massive buying, or excuse me, selling, followed by panic buying. This is Ether, and it's a longer-term daily chart. You can see a couple bottoms back uh, in both 2018 and then 2020, followed by the RSI bottoming off of the oversold levels. Well, it appears that we're looking at something similar here. The case makes the, the idea that either could go back above $2,000. But a longer-term chart, a weekly chart or a monthly chart is always going to be more uh, compelling. This is the monthly chart of Bitcoin that we looked at last week. And you can see in relation to its 50-month moving average, Bitcoin always holds it like a glove. Very strong support. Those buyers stepping up in 2020 below that level briefly over the weekend, Kaylee. Bitcoin below that level briefly right now. They're trying to find support. There is a more internal technical suggesting that we could see Bitcoin in very fairly short order, go back above $30,000 per Bitcoin. And so, yes, maybe capitulation is at hand. All right, Abigail Doolittle with a look at the technicals. Thank you so much. So let's get more now with Kavita Gupta, Delta Blockchain Fund founder, who is joining us. Kavita, what do you think? Did we see a bottom form? Hi, Kelly. Thank you for having me. No, I don't think so. I think we are going to see yet bottom. I'm going to stick to the prices, which I have been thinking, even starting January this year, that we should go at some point 14 to 16K for Bitcoin. I still think we haven't seen the bottom for ETH. Um, not only because the way market is going down and there's buying, I bought some, and this is not a financial advice, but like I really believe in the technology long term. So I bought some. So you're always going to see big sale, uh, big sell and then some something being picked up because people start buying it's a great opportunity to buy and then you start seeing the same coast down so i don't think we are at the bottom yet in terms of uh, another catalyst for the way down is staked ether a real problem uh, developing i mean the idea that uh, the merge is going to happen and everything's going to be beautiful and we're not going to use too much power um, in verifying the blockchain seems a little bit uh, whimsical. Um, I think for us from the technology side, uh, 
going proof of stake is a huge step for Ethereum. I think it just makes the network much more secure. It is using less energy and much ready to be much more scalable, though we still gonna have more gas fee. But Kavita, so it doesn't gonna... make the network much more secure if you have, you know, individual organizations holding 30% of it, or the idea that someone like an Elon Musk, or even worse, a Vladimir Putin could come in with billions of dollars and just take it over? No, because you have validator nodes and there's a limitation of how much do you stake, how many validator nodes you run comparatively to anybody putting up a mining rigs and just keep on doing. Why for the longest time people kept on thinking China will take over Bitcoin because based on where you are really doing mining, which nobody has control on, you are part of the network. With validator nodes, there are a lot of validation which is happening, how much are you staking, which addresses, how many validators you are doing. It is actually, I personally feel technology-wise, this is much more safe and much more decentralized. Okay, so Matt talked about the issue of staked Ether. All of the other issues that the, the broader crypto ecosystem has had to grapple with kind of all at once. First, the collapse of Terra USD, then the halting of withdrawals from Celsius, all against a macroeconomic backdrop that is turning against risk, tightening of financial conditions, less abundant liquidity. Where do you place the greatest blame for the kind of dramatic collapse we have seen take shape in recent days? I know, uh, Kelly, I think it's going back to like really expanding the leverage. Too much of greed, too much of going without really understanding, borrowing and lending between the different DeFi's which the collateralization overextended and nobody really going into the dynamics or the technology or to understand where the math's coming from because the whole place was just booming, right? And then one single, like everything went down like house of cards as we saw with Terra, then with Anchor Protocol, like not able to support it. Then we saw Celsius. Then we started seeing a lot of funds like 3AC and there are much more which is gonna slowly over next month or two you're going to see which have major liquidation problem. I think it started all the way back mid last year when big institutional money started coming into DeFi instead of just DeFi being the game of crypto natives. And that big institutional money going at the uh, discounted tokens from Luna to a bunch of layer ones and then all these DeFi protocols to provide leverage created this big mess. This is very similar to how we saw it in MBS AVS market back in 07, 08. Yeah, messy indeed. Kavita, we have a Bloomberg Terminal uh, user writing in. You can always write into the show on IBGO on your terminal. But the question is this. Mining requires technical skill and money. Proof of stake just requires money. So how will that help decentralization? So uh, on the on the base level, he's he or she is absolutely right. But, but the difference is mining also makes as an institutional mining rig. So most of the mining which happened in the earlier days, it was people like us putting one or two blocks at our home and mining it. That's not true anymore. The electricity prices, the institutionalization of it, make it like a whole corporate affair. So you have huge public companies mining it, and that is not decentralization. But the validator note, yes, you do need thirty to eat and you do need to stake it but that is also overtaking the part that hey you have skin in the game you are just not doing it as a service to other people you believe in it you want to take care of it because you have a deposit you're going to be true to what you are validating mm. and you're going to keep it up to date Kavita I just have a quick question about Sam Bankman Freed and FTX we saw him uh, reach out with a credit line for Voyager I think almost 500 million dollars he's buying embed now he's giving a credit line to BlockFi is he the white knight of the crypto winter I mean he seems to be um, helping a number of different entities stay afloat or taking them over. I think this is the best time for MA. I think what they are doing is great. First of all, they are not US registered. They are not public comparatively to Coinbase. So they have much more, uh, you know, uh, power on what, where all they can go and how they can expand. So I think this gives them a lot of freedom um, and from regulations, from the money they, uh, the sectors they are going into. And I feel like this is perfect for an exchange because they have the maximum liquidity, right? And they can actually provide those things to block fine and Voyager and have a very, very uh, preferable, preferential partnerships and uh, equity deals out there. And we're going to see FTX playing much and much bigger role in it. I think there are few companies who plan to have a lot of liquidity and go into cheaper deals when the market is down. And I feel like FTX is one of them.
Kudos right. to them for that. All right, Kavita, great having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Kavita Gupta there, Delta Blockchain Fund founder. Coming up, we're going to discuss the growing interest around NFTs with Amy Wu. Wait, is it still growing? Is there still a growing interest <laughs> around NFTs? We'll, we'll talk ask about her. that. Absolutely. She said Adventures Gaming and M&A at FTX. Plus, we'll talk about betting on the drawdown with details of the new short Bitcoin ETF that launches today. And to access all the latest data and news on crypto on your Bloomberg terminal type CRYP GO, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller. Now let's take a look at what's going on in the NFT world. As broader crypto prices dropped this year, NFT prices have as well, but they are rebounding in tandem today. Bloomberg's Shanali Bostic joins us now with the details. Shanali. Yeah, it's interesting, Kaylee. You have about a 5% jump in Bitcoin prices over 24 hours and a nearly 8% jump in NFT index. So let's look at the overall market data that overpins that over a longer time horizon. Over 30 days, the volumes on OpenSea have dropped by almost 200% percent to 783 million. Looks Rare has also seen a more than 80 percent drop in volumes to 230 million dollars. But the two marketplaces alone still show more than one billion dollars worth of volumes in that month long period. Let's talk for a second longer about the Bored Ape Yacht Club collection. Given how large it is, the fact that pieces have sold for more than millions of dollars and has captured the favor of celebrities across the world. The more recent sales have been in the range of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yet the industry is still seeing soaring valuations in some areas. Take today, just Magic Eden, a marketplace that saw a roughly tenfold increase in valuation since March with new funding just announced today. All right, Chanali, thanks very much. Bloomberg Chanali Bassick talking to us about MFT. We'll continue that conversation right now with Amy Wu. She is the FTX head of Ventures Gaming and M&A. She joins us in the studio. And Amy, we are seeing, uh, well, the, the conference now is one of the biggest uh, crypto conferences, NFT NYC. Um, how is it going? I mean, has, uh, ha has the interest waned with the prices of crypto? It's a good question because I've been asked that a lot. Um, you know, is it all gloom and doom, you know, this week at NFT NYC, which is, I think, the biggest crypto conference of the year and which reflects sort of the mainstream interest of growing a mainstream interest of NFTs. It's interesting because um, I think that... Um, People are a lot more optimistic than even I expected. You really see sort of a dichotomy between traders of crypto and build technology builders in crypto. And, um, and so when I meet with a lot of NFT founders and also tech founders here at the conference, they are aware of the volatility and everyone feels, you know, kind of their, their wallets being a lot lighter with the, <laughs> with the token prices dropping. However, they are kind of shutting that all out and being very focused and heads down on building. And almost pretty much consistently, every team has communicated communicated that to me. But is there a sense that there was maybe just a little too much froth in it and actually things have normalized to a more suitable or appropriate level in some sense? I would say definitely. Um, it's, NFT market is even younger than the crypto, uh, crypto token markets, right, which is also still pretty nascent. And that, um, how early those markets are, is reflected in how volatile uh, these kind of micro cycles of NFT bust and boom are, right? And so I would say that, like, so far, um, the, the majority of the NFT holders are looking at it. There's, there's an increasing number of collectors, but I would say there's still a lot of speculation. But this NFT NYC conference, you know, I'm here because a lot of them actually have, are actually creating real utility, whether that's in mm. commerce or entertainment and collaborations with real life brands. Um, and, and I think the next step of the NFT market is to provide utility to users. And when we see that, you actually see the industry maturing a lot more, because right now, now it's mostly JPEGs and that's sort of the values in the eye of the beholder and that changes a lot depending on you know how the crypto I, I actually doing. wonder about that I mean we see really brands more than art right or we see monetization no one can own LeBron's dunk right do you meet at, at the conference real artists like a woman putting her heart and soul into a piece that's an NFT rather than just 
you know, a factory making um, profitable products? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting both and it really takes both, right? So, you know, yesterday I met with the founder of CryptoPunks and also there's other NFT founders and a lot of these NFT founders, quite frankly, are artists, right? They were artists before the NFT boom. They are now, they're just, um, you know, creating works of art in a different medium. But they need to partner a lot of times with you know, a, a CEO and, and who actually will build a business around what is essentially valuable IP. For example, mm. Yuga Labs bringing in Nicole with a media um, agency background who's now building out essentially an entertainment business um, on top of Border Yacht Club, CryptoPunks and, and other IP. Um, I think it kind of takes both and, th and that, that is the evolution of the space. So when you take these meetings and you attend conferences like NFT NYC, are you shopping? What kind of opportunities are you looking for at FTX right now? Uh, so at FTX, so we actually are continuing to deploy capital. You know, we are in a very fortunate position, both at FTX and FTX Ventures, to have a lot of capital. And I think, you, as you've seen with BlockFi and, and some of the investments that we've recently done and more that we will be soon announcing, that we are very active in this market. You know, there are great teams that are building on a long-term basis, and we want to continue backing them. Now, the valuations have adjusted in this market, yeah. which is great for investors. It's a discount. It, I mean, if you're shopping, this is the right time to right. do it. It seems like Bargain. your boss, Sam Bankman-Fried, is doing a little bit of shopping today with Embed. Plus, he's also able to, uh, to, to give loans or lines of credit to companies, probably um, with great valuations. Is FTX shopping right now? I would say we're, you know, always open to opportunities. And um, but in what? What specifically would you be looking for? So across the what board, I think on ventures, it's always about uh, backing great founders, right? And, and right now, we're spending a lot of our time on the infrastructure space and looking at blockchain level sort of companies to, to back. Um, on the FTX side, you know, we're looking at our roadmap, and that's everything from like geographic focus to specific product focus. You know, obviously with Embed that we announced today, it was really around our interest in, in stocks and being more of like a one-stop shop for, you know. A user actually you know, using our application across different things that the asset classes they want to buy. Um, and so we're looking at different consumer products and also financial service products, crypto and non crypto, um, and also in different geos as a way to expand our business. And, you know, kind of what we were looking at is a buy build partner um, framework. And sometimes when we find great teams and we're aligned, you know, around the, the structure, then we would love to be strategic partners with them. What about GameFi? Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, always interesting. GameFi in the last, I think, I would say, kind of nine months has gone through an absolute evolution, right? You have the the rise of Axie Infinity, sort of like as the first sort of play to earn um, game, and then you know they've they've unfortunately went through a lot of challenges, and I think that's sort of like the growing pains of an early industry, which is Web3 games. And then, you know, like, you know, we have actually met with almost every major gaming company at this point across the globe as they're exploring Web3. And a large gaming company sees their investments as a portfolio of games that they're constantly sort of, you know, building and launching, of which it makes sense for them, almost all of them, to be looking at Web3 as one of the experiments they are, they are looking at, right? And so where they're doing that, you know, FTX, we would love to partner with them in doing so, um, launching Web3 games and non-fungible and fungible tokens. And so we remain really bullish that, that gaming is one of the potential ways to bring a mainstream audience into crypto. Now, yeah. social networks, you know, um, NFTs, NFT brands, those are all also pillars as well in consumer internet. Mm. Um, and we're really excited about all of those over the kind of like the next like five plus year framework. If we you think, do a partnership yeah. with Call of Duty, <laughs> tell me about it because. Not Grand Theft Auto, that's what I'm saying. Or Grand for. Theft Auto, you know, I'm or, a GTA I mean, fan the, myself. The Xbox <laughs> games for me, but that's a little bit too mainstream. I'm too old probably for this. Amy, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate you having you here in the studio. Amy Wu, FTX head of Ventures Gaming and MA. Coming up, betting big on a drawdown. A new short Bitcoin ETF launches today of all days. We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines. And we want to get to some of the stories that caught our eye this week, right? BlockFi is one we've been talking yeah. about 
already getting a $250 million credit line from FTX. The agreement is meant to provide the lender, the crypto lender, with access to capital that further bolsters its balance sheets. It comes amid increased liquidity concerns, and it's not the first time Sam Bankman Freed has extended lines of credit. Yeah, what'd you call him? The white knight of the crypto winter. Meanwhile, BitFarms is making an about face. The crypto mining company has sold 3,000 Bitcoin for $62 million over the past week to boost its liquidity. It's one of the first self-proclaimed Bitcoin hoarding miners to turn away from accumulated mine coins. Crypto bears are getting a new tool to bet on declines. The ProShare Short Bitcoin Strategy ETF launches today, becoming the first inverse exchange-traded fund in the U.S. linked to the largest cryptocurrency. Of course, Bitcoin is down already 70% from its peak, which uh, begs the question, are they coming in at the bottom? Joining us to talk more about this is Katie Greifeld, host uh, of Bloomberg ETF IQ, who also wrote this story. I did. Um, and we were all talking about it over the weekend. Congrats on the story, by Thank the way. You. And what's the deal? I mean, it seems like exactly the wrong time to come out with this. I mean, if you think there's more pain to come, you could say it's exactly the right time. Sure, it might have been better two weeks ago, but... Or in November of last year. Or in November of last year. The ProShares is very interesting because, remember, they were the issuer who brought the Bitcoin strategy ETF, the first U.S. futures mm -hmm. Bitcoin ETF to launch in the U.S. That was the top, pretty much, <laughs> I would say. You could say it was Matt Damon, some of those crypto.com commercials, could say it was the Super Bowl, but they launched about two weeks before that peak. Now they're launching the inverse product. Who knows if it'll mark a bottom, but if you think there's more Bitcoin pain to come, this is probably the ETF for you. Why not just short Bitcoin directly? It's a great question. If you think about how you would actually do that, I mean, ProShares is thinking there's probably a lot of people who don't want to open a margin account, go through the process of shorting Bitcoin outright. If you look at this fund, it has a fee of 95 basis points, which is high in the ETF world. But if you think about Bitto, for example, what it would cost to short Bitto, there's data from S3 Partners, which shows the financing fee there is probably 13.9 percent. So if you're looking at all your options, this is probably cheaper and maybe easier than some of the other ways. I bought my first Bitcoin uh, for $600 at Webster Hall in 2013. At Webster Hall? I feel Hall. like if I was going to short it, I had to go down there and borrow some from somebody, <laughs> you know, yeah. and then sell it. Um, what about other Bitcoin ETFs? Are we ever going to get, like the Winklevi, it was like 10 years ago that they suggested a Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's been a long history. I don't know. We could see more uh, inverse Bitcoin ETFs before we actually see that holy grail spot Bitcoin ETF. You have active filings right now from Direction, from AXS. So there's other issuers who also want to launch products such as these. ProShares was the first, though, as they were the first with the first Bitcoin futures ETF. Yep. All right, Katie, thanks so much for joining us. Katie Greifeld uh, there. You can catch the two of us together on ETF IQ. That's tomorrow at 1 p.m. New York time. Normally it's on Mondays, yeah. but also Holidays. a lot of times it's on Wednesdays. So, well, and on Tuesdays, you and I will be here, Matt. Yes. Bloomberg Crypto, 1 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be talking with Troy Goyeski of SF FS Investments next week. This is Bloomberg.